both of those cards. Church. Good morning. Apologize for the eyes. They're not functioning this morning well, so uh, it's not Hollywood, it's just eyes. <laughs> <laughs> not a rock star, huh? No, no. Let's, uh, let's stand and have prayer, and then we'll have our pledge of allegiance to the flag. Father, we thank you for the privilege that you have provided for us this morning for us to be here, the church in the church house. We thank you, Father, and we ask blessings on all of the fathers. Today is Father's Day, and you are the father of us all. Not that we earn it or deserve it, but it's because of who and what you are that we are. We pray, Father, and we ask that everything that we do this morning in word, thought, and deed would be to your honor and to your glory. Enable us, Father, to continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Amen. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You're, you're going to provide us for the <laughs> We'll see. Oh, we'll see. That's a good thing. Uh, leaning on the everlasting arms, 
Thank you, Pastor. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Pastor. You just home right through that. <clears throat> the Word of God is alive and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. A man of God might be fully equipped unto all good works. Let's open God's word. <clears throat> Excuse me. Open God's word this morning to Well, let's start with uh, the first chapter of Acts. Acts chapter 1. I think we'll be looking at uh, a couple of chapters here in Acts, but before we get started this morning, let's take a few minutes to concentrate and just settle on where we are and just focus our thoughts. Let's bow together for just a little bit. Father, we thank you for the privilege that you have provided for us this morning, not only to be the church in the church house, but you have provided for us your inerrant word, your inerrant immutable word. We pray, Father, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that God the Holy Spirit will enlighten us, teach us and show us in the times which we find ourselves, we are in desperate need of the honesty and integrity that we find in the scriptures. We ask, Father, that we might continue to focus and concentrate in an ever-darkening world to be able to absorb and retain, to be able to cycle and continue to grow in grace and in the full knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. Mm -hmm. Can you read this for me, please? We are looking at the Constitution of the United States. I want... Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Judy to read from the uh, second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall deem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Thank you. Why do we need to read this? Why do we have the Constitution? Because of who and what our nation is. In the past 240 plus years, we've only had one Constitution, just one. And the attempt now is to alter or destroy totally this Constitution. 
we find our government as it is today that is in a state of what I, I call a uh, satanic freefall. That it doesn't matter <clears throat> what the people think, we are the people. It doesn't matter what we think. The government says that our rights come from the government, not according to the Constitution and not according to the inerrant word of truth. We come from our inalienable rights are from our sovereign God that we serve. We are who and what we are because of who and what he is, not because of who and what our government says they want us to be. <clears throat> if we look at where we are today as a nation, and we look around the world as to how the world looks at this present leadership, they perceive weakness. They perceive a situation that is in chaos, in anarchy. There are cities throughout the length and breadth of our nation that, for whatever reasons, have gone continuously uh, looting and burning and, and robbery, etc. These things are not only unconstitutional, they are, uh, lack, a, they are a total of lack of lawlessness and godlessness. And yet we have mayors and governors that do absolutely nothing against these things. The southern border, for example, God says a nation without borders is no nation at all. And in the Abrahamic <coughs> covenant, we find that Abraham was promised under the covenant to be a blessing to all the families. <coughs> all the families on the planet. Well, Abraham is a blessing to all the families. But how does that come to come into fruition? By means of the sovereign God that we serve and what our Christ did on the cross. But when you have situations that are totally tyrannical and there are things that should be rock solid that are running amok, and you have such things that uh, reek with the stench of arrogance and false pride, then you have a serious problem in the nation. We do have a serious problem in our nation. And the only way to resolve the problems in our nation are <clears throat> to take our problems to the God that we serve. And I don't see that happening very much with this administration. It seems that that's the last thing they want. We find the body of Christ around our globe being persecuted in one respect or another. We in our infinite wisdom have murdered in the womb better than 60 plus million babies. How do you rationalize that? Well, what we have done is murdered in the womb, every single person, man, woman, and child, in the entire state of, in the entire nation of Canada. And it goes on beyond that. We, we have individuals that would perceive abortion not as murder, but as a means of women's rights. Well, I don't have a problem with that. But what I do have a problem with, when you go beyond that and you get into a situation where nobody asks the one who's being carried, what are his thoughts? How does he feel about what's coming up as far as an abortion is concerned? <clears throat> there are multitudes of things that are on my mind this morning, things that I would like to share with you. Uh, we find, if, if I can 
see this well enough to pass along to you. The, the, the eyes are not functioning at all this morning. But anyway, if you look in that first chapter of Acts, and, and I'd like to share with you the first chapter, uh, a number of passages, uh, verses, and the second chapter. But anyway, first chapter, chap, uh, chapter 1, verse verse 1 of, of uh, the first chapter of Acts. It says, the first account I composed Theophilus. This is Luke writing to, uh, I believe, it, who is a Roman uh, citizen, perhaps an official, I'm not quite sure, but anyway, it's Theophilus. And he is putting together a, a historical account of the things as he says, about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until, verse 2, until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what Luke is, is writing in this first chapter is what the Christ said before the ascension. And he has ordered them to, <coughs> excuse me, the apostles to stay there until 40 days later, which is Pentecost. And he is saying to them, Wait until you have been indwelled by the Holy Spirit. That's basically what he's saying to them. In verse 6 we read, So, when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea, and in Samaria, and to the outermost part of the earth. How often do we take the time, as it were, to realize the fact that as a Christ-centered, Bible-based, born-again believer, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit? That means that our physical well-being becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes we really have to concentrate on that because in certain circumstances, regardless of what they might be, we tend to forget these things. And these are not things that we neither earn or we deserve. These are things because of what the Christ did on the cross. 
And we are the recipients of that. We call it salvation. We are saved by His grace, God's mm -hmm. grace. And the object of our faith is the Christ Himself. So, grace alone, in Christ, in by faith alone, in Christ alone. Now that's the simplification, as it were, of the gospel. But this is what Luke was writing to Theophilus, when you think about it. <clears throat> he goes on to say, in verse 9, still in chapter 1, after he had said these things, he was lifted up, while they were looking on, they being the apostles, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was, while he was going, behold, two men in white, while <clears throat> in white, <clears throat> white clothing stood beside them. They also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into the heavens, will come in just this same way as you have watched him go into the heavens. Where did this occur? On the Mount of Olives. So, what were they saying to the apostles? He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. The difference will be, this time, he will stand on the Mount of Olives, and they will be split. That's what he's saying. They were conveying, they being the two men in white, let's say the angels, were conveying to the apostles the second advent of his coming. That's what they were actually doing. Where you say, my goodness, how does that affect us? It enables us to be alert and be continuously, <clears throat> be continuously on the watch and understanding and realizing that the second advent will occur regardless of where we are as far as the things that are going on in the world are concerned. There is nothing that needs to happen as far as the rapture of the church is concerned. There are multitudes of signs that lead to the time in which the second advent will occur. For example, Satanic influence is running amok, as it were. We, we see the uh, satanic influence all across the world. The body of Christ is being persecuted right here in our own country. We see also that lies, lies, are being presented as truth. That which is good is called evil. And that's just a few of the signs. We see the transition, as it were, in Jerusalem and, and Israel. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu <clears throat> was the prime minister for a period of 12 years. Well, now they are in the Knesset, which is similar to our Congress, as it were. Um, they're putting together what they perceive and what they call uh, a kind of a mixed coalition. Prior to Netanyahu being removed, as it were, there was basically peace in, in, in Israel. Shortly after that, 
There were bombings in Gaza. There was disruption uh, along the, the uh, <clears throat> other areas of Jerusalem, of Israel. Um, even our own nation, as it were. The federal government is supposed to take care of the southern border. The, according to the Constitution, the federal government has the responsibility to protect and defend and secure the nation and protect the citizens. This is not happening. Three states, Texas, Florida, uh, and Arizona, have put forth a, a maximum effort and still are doing it to protect that southern border. Now, just so that you know, um, people say, well, those are the border states. Let's be, let's be honest about this. With the number of illegal individuals that are coming across that border, all 50 of our nation, of our states are border states, because we don't know where these individuals are going. We don't know what their, their, their health is like. We have no idea uh, what we're actually dealing with as far as the individuals are concerned. We have a multitude of, of, of uh, abandoned children. And as we have heard, and it's been alluded to member, uh, a number of times, this is putting an extreme pressure on the smaller communities in that border area. That's understandable. But the thing of it is, the thing of it is, the whole nation is suffering from this. And yet, there are those who refuse to accept it even as a crisis. They will not understand and realize that there is a problem in our nation that is not being dealt with. So you say, how does that affect us? Us being the body of Christ. We need to pray continuously for our nation. We need to pray for the leadership of our nation or the lack thereof as the case may be. It affects us as the body of Christ because we perceive a grave injustice. And these things bother us as the body because we know over and above being uh, focused on the scripture, we know that these things are not right. And these things overall affect uh, our nation as a whole. Now, you say, well, if there is a satanic problem, and there is, then there has to be the opposite side of the coin, which is, it's a sin problem, not a skin problem. Now, regardless of what they want to peddle, and there are a number of things that have come to the surface that are, are making a fetal, as it were, futile attempt to be peddled. For example, there are terms that many of us probably have never heard before, such as critical race theory, um, things like uh, cultural Marxism, systemic racism, etc. Fill in the blanks. This is sinfulness. This is satanic influence. When you get to the point as a nation, when you start tampering with your history of that nation, you are ultimately cutting the foundation of that nation. And I use just one nation as an example of what I'm saying. Venezuela, was, for example, was not always what it is today. Always. It is a lot different today than it was prior to socialism and communism moving into it. I just use that one nation as an example. 
So how does that affect us? Honesty and integrity. We have to look at these things for what they are. We have to be able to say wherever it needs to be, whether it's the school board, whether it's, it's uh, our congressmen or representatives, wherever it happens to be, whatever it needs to be. We need to confront them and say, we have a problem. There's something wrong here. Because what this says, what this is being peddled, a lies. There's something called a 1619 project. Disgusting. To alter our history as a nation. That's disgusting. We fail to realize that every day that we are alive, every day that we are alive, history is going on. History is going on. Fifty years from today, no matter how you play with it, somebody is going to record we will gather the, the church in the church house. I just use that as an example. You can twist that. You can do anything you want to do with it. But the truth of the matter is we are here today. And all of us that are here will accept and remember that fact. But no matter what you do with it, you cannot alter that historical fact. <clears throat> so how does this equate to what we were saying earlier about these things that are playing games with history? What we just read here in Acts 1 and, and, and Acts 2, there were eyewitnesses. The strongest evidence is eyewitness the evidence of the fact that these things actually happened. Well, how do you know? Because I was there. I can account for that fact because I was there. These individuals, no matter what happens, they were there. They saw what happened. The apostles saw what transpired when the Christ was ascended. Now, if you want to play games with that, that's fine, but you still have that eyewitness account. Which means that in order to alter that, you're going to have to confront every single one of those eyewitnesses and see if they are willing to change what they saw. That's not going to happen. So how does this, <coughs> how does this come into play? as to what we were just talking about. You can't change history. <laughs> there are multitudes of people that can say what you have written or what you have said or what this particular article says, that's not true. Because I was there or the eyewitness account says that I was there, I heard what happened and I saw what happened. This is not true. This is a lie. So that's where we're going with this, and that's what we are encountering now as far as our society is concerned. It's something called cultural Marxism. What does that mean? It means a communistic or socialistic attempt to destroy and change our nation based on its history and the, the Judeo-Christian heritage that has made our nation what it is. I never hesitate to say to someone who asks, <clears throat> if you really want to know how great our nation is, take a trip outside of our nation. And it doesn't matter where you go, whether it's across the border to Canada, which is slowly being changed by the way, to what I perceive to be a socialist situation. I can't prove that, but that's what I see going on. But you begin to realize that as far as our nation is concerned, 
Have we had problems? Yes. Uh, have we made mistakes along the way? Yes. But there is no other nation on this planet. Let me repeat that. There's no other nation on this planet where you can go as far as your determination and hard work will take you. The only thing that will shut you down is you. If you want to accomplish any objective in this nation, under the freedom that is provided for us by this Constitution, you can get her done. But there are forces at work that would like to alter and change that. And this is what I'm talking about. We cannot allow that. We cannot allow that. There is no mass exit from our country. There is a mass entrance into our country. <clears throat> I wish I could share with you the number of stories that I have heard eyeball to eyeball about people that did whatever they had to do to come into our country for one reason, a better way of life. And they had the freedom to, to chase, as it were, pursue what their dreams and ambitions were. We cannot allow that to deteriorate. And yet there are all kinds of efforts. And the efforts stem from satanicism. Satan would like nothing better than to destroy this nation for everything that has transpired because of our nation. There is no nation on the planet that has sent out more missionaries to more remote areas of the world than we have. I just use that as one example. So, <clears throat> this is where we are. This is the burr, as it were, that I had under the saddle blanket that I wanted to share with you. Uh, these are things that I think we need to be totally aware of, cognizant of. And we can't emphasize it too much. Always, always keep the body of Christ in, in continual, continuous prayer. Pray for our nation as a whole. Um, pray for our leadership or the lack thereof, as the case may be. Pray for all of our first responders, for our military. I remember when I was overseas in the military, you could spot an American GI anywhere on the planet. One reason, the uniform. You knew who that was. That's not the case now. That's not the case now. When I was overseas, <clears throat> you could look for the American embassy wherever it happened to be. And you knew where it was because you could see this flag flying the top of the building. You're not sure when you see an American embassy around the globe, you're not sure what's going to be on the pole. Whether or not that's going to fly or something else is going to fly. It's not the way it used to be. Let me close by saying this. I'll tell you why I'll say this. <clears throat> if you ever have a chance to go to Washington, go to Arlington National Cemetery, which is the largest national cemetery in our country, there are 96 of them. Arlington is the largest one, more than 600 acres on a quiet, if possible, afternoon, and you get a chance, go up to the changing of the God. There's a large area up there where you can, it's at the tomb of the unknown soldiers. But walk through the stones. Just walk through the tombs quietly. <clears throat> 
walk between the stones. Why do I say that? Well, I've got a number of relatives and family members that are buried there. All of those brothers and sisters there did not hesitate to lay down their lives to provide for us the freedom that we share. And that's why I say, <clears throat> if you have an opportunity, just walk quietly between the stones. Each one of those is marked. Every single one of them is marked. And it's properly arrayed. But if you so desire, you can step off the path and take a look at the stone. And it will tell you who's buried there. Let's bow together, shall we? Father, we, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this portion of your inherent immutable word. We thank you, Father, for the freedom that we have to be able to gather the church in the church house. The freedom that we have because of who and what you are. The grace and the mercy that you have continuously poured out on us. We neither earn nor do we deserve. You are the sovereign God that we serve. There is nothing that goes on in our lives that you are not totally and fully aware of. You are the one who meets every single need that we have one day at a time. And so, Father, we thank you. Thank you, an attitude of gratitude for things that we neither earn nor do we deserve. We thank you for the spark that provides the heartbeat that you have graciously provided for us. We thank you for the breath that we breathe, inhale and exhale. We thank you for our families, and we pray and we thank you for all the fathers. We pray earnestly, Father, that the fathers of our nation will step forth and accept the responsibility of being fathers. We pray this, Father, in the powerful Maxwell's name of our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> that he might be honored and glorified. And all of us together say, Amen. 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 That's our story, and we're sticking to it, so there. Amen. Message. Return that which you have entrusted to us as stewards. We thank you, Father, for this privilege, and we thank you for the fact that we can do that because of who and what you are. We pray that all of it, Father, would be used for the furthering of the kingdom. All of this, we ask all of this in Christ's name, that he might be honored and glorified. All of us together say, Amen. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings, blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you, thank you. You are welcome. <laughs>